Our next speaker is Dr. Lee Beers. She's a pediatrician and tireless advocate for child health. She is the A. James and Alice B. Clark Distinguished Professor of Early Childhood Intervention and Advocacy and the Medical Director for Community Health and Advocacy at Children's National. She oversees the Child Health Advocacy Institute's Community Mental Health Corps, which includes initiatives such as the Early Childhood Innovation Program. She was the 2021 president of the American Academy of Pediatrics where I personally got to see her passion and leadership. Uh, she's the lead of the behavioral health domain of the Pediatric Pandemic Network. Her presentation is entitled, Looking Forward, Addressing the Mental Health Crisis in Children and Adolescents. Oh, well, wonderful. Good morning, everyone. Um, really nice to see you all today and uh, happy to be here to talk with you about this topic. Um, you know, I think it is a challenging topic, but one that there is tremendous passion and momentum towards, uh, and and one that I think there is a lot of opportunity to come to some solutions um, and to do better by our our children and families. Um, I have no conflicts. Pediatricians usually don't. Um, our objectives for today are just gonna talk about a few things. Um, I, I am gonna talk a little bit about the scope of the pediatric mental health care crisis and the impacts of the pandemic. I think um, anyone who has picked up a newspaper or their phone in the past three years has certainly seen something about this, um, but I, I do think it's important to ground us in, in sort of where we are and what the real scope of the challenge is. I'm going to talk a little bit about the PPN Mental and Behavioral Health Core domain composition and some of the things that we're doing, uh, and then talk a little bit more about the future directions uh, of what we'd like to do together. I already have sort of scribbled some notes to myself after Dr. Coyne Beasley's talk about some additional things that I, new ideas that have come into mind even in the past 10 minutes. So, <laughs> um, so, you know, again, as I said, this is, it, it doesn't, you, you all know that mental health is a concern for children and youth, um, but there's a few things that I, I want to highlight that that are are re reflected in some of these these headlines and reports. I think one important thing um, um, you see this this study new HHS study shows significant increases in children diagnosed with mental health conditions from 2016 to 2020. So I think this is one important point that we'll talk about is that this is not a problem unique to the pandemic. This is not something that started with the pandemic. Um, the pandemic certainly exacerbated uh, already increasing rates of mental health concerns in our youth, and, and it exacerbated the fragility of the mental health system so that our youth were, were and families were not able to access the care that they needed. I think also you see a couple headlines here. Um, this is a, a group who knows this intimately, I think, but but while while maybe traditionally we have thought of mental health care being provided in um, uh, specialty mental health clinics or community-based mental health clinics, that, that care is really quite diffuse now. Um, children with mental health concerns are being seen in the emergency departments, in their subspecialty offices, in their primary care offices, and, and we have no, no, there's no, op we can't turn away there is no option but to figure out a better way to care for kids because they're coming to us in all settings. Um, and I think the other piece to really um, note is that is that children live in families. And it's not just children who have been impacted by the pandemic or by the past decade or so. Um, um, and so it's not just children who are experiencing mental health concerns, but it's their parents. And we know from lots of research that the mental health of parents and families um, really have a profound influence on the mental health and well-being of children. Children. And then these final two sort of things here, um, the report from our Surgeon General, his advisory, uh, Protecting Youth Mental Health, and the APA CAP and Children's Hospital Association Declaration of a Mental Health Emergency. I think I bring that up just to speak to the fact that this is, as I noted at the start of the talk, um, th this is a concern that really is elevated to the highest levels of our government and our society. And I do think that there is a momentum um, and I do think that there is a willingness to really think um, innovatively and transformatively about how to tackle this, this challenge. Um, and I think it's an opportunity that we can't waste. So again, just to summarize um, a little bit, um, some of the things that, that I highlighted in those, those headlines, 
Um, but, but just a few things to, to highlight about our system of care that I think become very relevant when we think about the PPN and the way that we respond to, to this mental health emergency. Um, you know, I'll share a few more data points about this, but as we noted, there's increasing rates and severity of mental health concerns. Um, but it is also important to note that not all youth are affected equally, um, neither in, in um, their risk for mental health concerns or their ability to access quality and culturally appropriate care. Access to care is poor. Um, it is uh, uh, worse in some places. It's not really good anywhere. Um, it's worse in some places than others. Um, you know, speaking, you know, looking at the map that, that was shared in the last presentation, you know, we think about our rural communities um, and the PPN scholars goal um, of thinking about how to access mental health care in rural communities. Um, but, but access to care is poor and, and, and more stressed in some places than others. Um, as I noted, um, all of us are increasingly at the front lines of providing mental health care. I think it's um, notable to me, this, this is a bit anecdotal, but but you know, maybe, maybe seven to 10 years ago when I first started working on this issue um, in more in more earnest, um, you know, I would I would most often hear from pediatricians that's about a decade ago is when I started really working on integrated mental health care on a systemic level. I would hear from pediatricians that their their main goal was to be able to refer patients to a specialty mental health care provider, um, and they were were there was there was a great reluctance um, by a lot of pediatricians, not all, but by a lot of pediatricians to really engage in 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 addressing mental health concerns of their patients directly, um, and I would say that that over the past 10 years and and even before the pandemic has dramatically shifted where I think pediatricians and those of us who are at the front lines of caring for children really um, we see no other way than to than to engage in that care and so there's I think a great willingness and openness um, to 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 transforming our systems. Um, integrated, and to that point, integrated mental health care and primary care, especially care in schools is becoming more essential. This is also essential because of our workforce challenges. There are not enough child psychiatrists, child mental health providers um, to, uh, to, to take care of the need. And so there is um, uh, it becomes even more important for all of us to sort of upskill essentially and be able to provide the care that we can provide to our level of expertise um, to make sure that kids are getting the best, most appropriate care in the place where they feel most comfortable and also to alleviate some of the burden on our specialty mental health providers um, so that they can be available to take care of those kids who have the most um, um, uh, acute and pressing mental health concerns, which is what we need for them to be doing. Um, and then again, um, I, I, there was another slide I took this sort of trans uh, picture of the slide, the transdisciplinary um, approach. Um, but this role of I'm going to change this word to to cross discipline to transdisciplinary <laughs> um, collaboration to prepare the mental the pediatric workforce and really increase access because this is not this is not something we can do alone. It's one of the things I actually love about our PPN mental health domain is the transdisciplinary nature of it. Um, it's not something we can do alone, and we all bring a piece of expertise to this work. Um, and again, you know, none of this is a surprising, I'll go through this quickly, but, but um, the, the bottom line here is that mental health concerns are quite common in children and adolescents. Um, you know, CDC estimates one in five children will, will experience a mental health disorder in any given year. And when you recognize that children do, there are ebbs and flows, they come into treatment and then in recovery, um, that this is a lot of kids. Um, uh, the most common disorders in youth are ADHD and anxiety, um, though, though, um, though, again, kind of reflecting the the um, uh, the the nature of depression, where of, of mood disorders, where you may may come in and out of recovery. Um, uh, over twenty percent of youth have experienced a major depressive episode as it, through as as di a diagnosed major depressive episode. But then, when you look at these sort of other statistics, where among high schoolers in twenty nineteen, and again, I will note this is before the pandemic. Um, over a third endorsed feeling persistently sad or hopeless in the past year, and nearly nineteen percent had seriously considered suicide. Suicide. And so lots of these kids aren't even being reflected in those numbers because they may not have a formal diagnosis, but they're struggling. And that's um, and we see that. Um, and, and we need to do better for, for our kids.
Um, again, just another note that that you know this is um, uh, to to drive home the point that that this is something that pre-existed the pandemic. Um, this is something that that has been a concern for youth and families um, for at least a decade, if not longer. Um, and the pandemic highlighted um, uh, uh, th this for many of us in in a very acute way. Um, but this is something that has 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 been brewing for quite some time. Um, and then, of course, um, all these things pre pre COVID, um, all these stressors then during the COVID nineteen pandemic were were heightened. Um, you you know all the things that that create stress and anxiety and concern for kids, all the things that that impact their support systems, that impact their ability to be resilient, were stressed and heightened by the pandemic. Um, so barriers to social services, disruptions to their family environment, um, a worsening of racial disparities, uh, uh, housing instability, barriers to safe transportation, all of these things amplified the concerns we were already seeing. And of course, um, there are groups with a higher baseline list who are higher, higher baseline risk who who um, were perhaps more vulnerable to these stressors during the course of the pandemic, um, including children and families of color, communities and families living in poverty um, or historically under-resourced communities, um, children who are refugees and seeking asylum, children with special health care needs. Um, I note um, LGBTQ plus youth is a particularly vulnerable population, and I note that that again during that previous during our previous presentation that was noted in um, as a as a need in the mental and behavioral health domain. Um, and most recently, actually, um, some, some studies have come out that girls and young women have been really profoundly impacted um, over the course of the past few years, um, disproportionately so. Um, so there's a lot, so th this really actually all ultimately encompasses almost all kids, right? <laughs> um, but it's important for us to recognize that, that there are these special populations and we have to think about um, them as individuals and as families and, and think about how we are individualizing their care. Um, again, lots of barriers to accessing care, and I promise we're going to talk about positive stuff too. Uh, <laughs> I, I always start with with the hard things, but there are a lot of barriers to accessing care, as we talked about inadequate workforce, and and that becomes even more so when you think about um, when when you need pediatric workforce who has specialized who have specialized training. So, for example, in trauma or in um, uh, early childhood, and and that 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 that, that pipeline gets even narrower. Um, there is remaining stigma and family reluctance, though I think that has been a bright spot over the course of the pandemic, um, is there has been a decrease in stigma around mental health concerns. It still certainly exists, um, but I think there is much more of a willingness, particularly among young people, to talk about the, their struggles um, and to support each other. Um, cost and insurance coverage availability is, is critical. And then again, reinforcing um, the this very important point that there are sub subgroups uh, which who are disproportionately impacted because of systemic racism and inequities in communities. And when we think about solutions, it's important for us to make sure that we're designing solutions that address those inequities um, and invest more in those places um, where there has, has historically been less. And when we invest, we also want to think about the entire continuum of care. I think particularly in the emergency department setting, we tend to think about the very acute, this, this far end um, of treatment um, part of the continuum of care. But, but any system works best when, when it is it is full when it is fully resourced and robust across the entire continuum from from health promotion to prevention to treatment to recovery and again youth and families will will move along this continuum back and forth and so it's important for not just each each sort of pie, piece of this pie to be strong but also the connections between them to be strong and i think that's an important place where as a ppn we can play a role um, and so now to just talk a little bit about how we're approaching this through the PPN. I'm super incredibly grateful to join the team. Um, I've been, I guess, with you guys six months now, five, six months. So incredibly grateful um, to, to join the team and to work with this really remarkable group of leaders um, um, across a wide variety of disciplines. But um, uh, Dr. Simpson shared the this slide before, but here we are. This is our little mental behavioral health under the core everyday domains. Um, and our domain infrastructure is set up very similarly to others, and we have representatives from all domain sites. Again, a very, very multidisciplinary group, actually, between pediatricians and emergency medicine, um, psychi psychology, psychiatry, 
social work, um, uh, pediatrician me. Uh, so it's really, it's really a great multidisciplinary group. Um, we also have, of course, our support from the network's operation team and our service domains. Um, and then, uh, the, well, this piece, I will admit, is a little bit of a work in progress, but we are identifying site leads to serve as liaisons to our other core domains. Some are already existing um, and some uh, to be identified. Um, and the overall coordination of our domain is now um, uh, being undertaken by myself um, and Trevor Covington, uh, who I am really delighted to be able to work with, as as Charles shared. You know, my background and expertise is really in mental health systems and not in disaster preparedness. Um, though I definitely, over the past few years, got some experience in that. Um, but uh, uh, but but Trevor has incredibly deep um, uh, expertise over many many years in disaster preparedness, um, including on site disaster response. And so it's been been really a pleasure to work together with him on this. Um, just to share a little bit about our charter um, overview and purpose, we uh, the charter was developed actually just prior to my coming on um, in the fall um, with the, the the first group of sites, I, I put, quote PPN 1.0, um, that's like how I often hear it referred to. Um, we are currently using that initial charter as a working draft, have gotten conceptual buy-in from all sites and are in the process of actively actually getting input from all of our stakeholders to refine the language. Um, I'll share with you the language, but they will also tell you that actually we're meeting with the domain at 1 p.m. today. And so uh, it's gonna change even um, by 2 p.m. So there will be some edits to it. Um, so I'll share the updates. It won't be dramatic edits, but um, so our, but, but the purpose of, of our domain is really to um, support the creation of integration of resources for behavioral and mental health services to kids um, during disasters, emergency, and pan pandemics, as well as everyday readiness. And I think this is quite important because just like anything, um, if you don't have a baseline of everyday readiness to address um, uh, any concerns, uh, that comes into, into uh, the emergency medical co continuum of care, um, you won't be able to address it in an emergency. And so, so we're really thinking about how do we, we make sure that there is a, a consistent baseline of everyday readiness, as well as the ability um, to respond uh, to, in, in the case, in the event of a, of a disaster emergency. Um, oh, I think I should also note, actually, part of the feedback that is being integrated and the changes that I think will happen even as of this afternoon. Um, okay, I think this is fine. Yes, looks like the computer is going to start in two hours, but restart in two hours, but I think we're okay. I'm not going to restart it now. Um, <laughs> That would not be a good, a good, a good thing. Um, but, but we do want to make sure there, there is absolutely an intent to ensure that there is an e emphasis on equity throughout all aspects of this charter. Um, we realized, looking back at it, that it wasn't quite as reflected in the language as we would like, and so that's part of the the revisions that are happening that we'll we'll see. Um, but here are our goals and objectives, um, really to increase the capacity uh, capacity and capability of telebehavioral health to deliver mental health services during sort of all aspects of disasters um, and preparedness, to develop and deliver training materials to improve mental health preparedness across health systems and their communities, um, including um, particular emphasis on children with special health care needs. Um, and again, you know, having training materials that are sort of prepared and ready to go for things that we may that that may be common types of disasters and emergencies but also the ability to to um, individualize those and uh, um, um, adapt them for a specific event um uh, but build or develop a model for triaging or, or an increasing mental health surge capacity in children's hospitals and disseminating that approach we'll, I'll share with you a little bit about some of the things happening there um working with state uh, federal state State, tribal and local agencies and healthcare facilities to improve access to mental health care resources during disasters and emergencies, and then working with schools, school based clinics, and other community partners to develop, disseminate, and educate on evidence based mental health screening tools and interventions to improve resilience. Um, so, this is a little um, again, this is this is. I would say a draft document here um, that we're we're beginning to put together, but it's just a little bit of a framing about the type of activities that are already happening um, within the domain. We really have sort of grouped the way we think about this into infrastructure building initiatives, which are initiatives that really build the sustainable foundations to promote accessible and equitable behavioral health care, um, enabling services, so services that are really more technical assistance type that are intended to build 
build capacity and connect providers and families to needed resources and then direct services. And, and like any good triangle, there's a lot at the bottom and less at the top because that is sort of what we are um, designed to do. Um, that's We're not a direct care organization where this is what, what we're designed to do. Um, but some of the things that we're working on, again, are developing the infrastructure through the domain to provide that ongoing and just-in-time expertise to all of our stakeholders, supporting research and evaluation, um, developing resource library, um, conducting environmental scans as needed, um, and to um, really make sure, I think Dr. Simpson noted, all the different expert groups and stakeholders who are involved in this effort. And there's a lot of activities that are actually happening across all of those groups that we don't want to duplicate, but we do want to elevate um, and, and think about then where, where might there be gaps that we can help fill specifically by the work of our domain. Um, and under enabling services, um, we are in the very early stages of collaborating with HRSA's um, Pediatric Mental Health Care Access uh, Technical Assistance Programs. We're very excited about that. I personally am very excited about that. That's a program that I um, have actually worked with, actually started one of those programs, um, and so see a lot of, of potential and capacity for being able to do um, a lot of work together with these programs who um, actually provide support and technical assistance and consultation to pediatric primary care providers around caring for children with mental and behavioral health needs in their practices. So there's a lot of opportunity um, to use these programs as a conduit for better collaboration between the emergency setting and the primary care setting. Um, uh, the, uh, our, our, some of our colleagues actually at Rainbow Babies and Dr. Burkhart and her team are working on a PPN network certificate of pediatric preparedness response in behavioral health, um, sort of a early version of that we're moving on to the website, but then also a, a more robust version of that is under development, um, to be disseminated more widely. So, so very excited about that. And then also, as I noted, there are a lot, there are a lot of activities happening amongst our partner groups and so really facilitating collaboration with those initiatives and with those groups. Um, I think a great example is the, the ED Stop Suicide um, QI Collaborative, which is being run out of the EIIC. I'm getting all the new acronyms down so, <laughs> um, for, for, for this work. And then, and I'll share a bit more details about this, but our direct service, uh, uh, the, the biggest direct service activity we have is our SciStar Triage and Learning Collaborative. Um, um, which is a really uh, terrific system. Actually, uh, more than half of our, our PPN domain sites are participating in this learning collaborative. And I'll, I'll share a bit more about that in a second um, with some slides. Um, but, but this is led um, by Dr. Chip Schreiber and his team um, um, and his colleagues out at Rapham. Um, and is a really, they you know, I just full credit to him. He, is, they, he and his team have been working on this for many, many years. Um, and it's a, it's a really um, terrific uh, uh, resource. So to tell you a little bit more about that, um, the SciStart Rapid Triage um, system, it's, so it's a, a structured approach to identifying patients who are at high risk for mental health problems. Um, and also, and, and I didn't, the, the focus is, and, and also um, in, in this way is able to respond to the, the ACS mental health, new ACS mental health screening standards. Um, but, but what it does is it provides rapid real-time triage, uh, a rapid real-time triage and case management system to to assess needs during a behavioral health crisis um, or traumatic event. Um, it is a triage tool that's intended for use by all community partners who are engaged in an emergency. And, and I'll share a little bit about uh, the next slide. We'll, we'll share actually a little screenshot of that. Um, but it also will give a population-based um, incident command system. So it, it gives some population-based based data. Um, I think one of the unique things about SciStart and Dr. Schreiber talks about this a lot and, and why this is important during it in the in these, these emergency context is it um, um, the, the questions are not um, asking the, the young person, how are you feeling or what was your, how are you feeling? But they are really focusing in on what the experience was. Um, and if that experience is one that would put you at risk for mental behavioral health concerns and flag you as someone who really needs to be connected to resources for, for, for further evaluation and potential support. So things like, and, and, it, and it doesn't, because of this, it doesn't require a mental health provider to, um, to 
to, to administer it. Um, it requires someone with some training around it and sensitivity and understanding about, about what, what the circumstances are, but it doesn't require direct questioning of the teen and how they're feeling. Um, and so it's a good, good tool to be used very rapidly in, in disaster emergency situations. You can see here some of the types of questions um, that, that it asks. And because it is a population health tool, it really actually provides these sort of wonderful dashboards to really help think about um, um, where uh, uh, where we may need to focus resources and what what where some of the concerns may be and where where we may be able to need to respond um, more uh, robustly. Um, and you can, it, it's, I mean, this is just a, a very deep screen. You can go very deep into individual communities. I wish I had thought to get Chip and his team to, I, I, I would have been afraid actually to do the, <laughs> to do the technology. I wouldn't have slept last night. So <laughs> I'm, I, I, that's, I, I, kudos to you. Uh, <laughs> I'm going with the screenshot. Um, but but uh, just to give you a sense as to sort of the type of, of population health dashboard that this can, um, uh, uh, show. Um, one thing to note, actually, this tool can be integrated with EPIC, um, but you do lose this population health mapping capability when it's integrated with, uh, with EPIC. So, um, so lots of, of opportunities here um, and, and lots of, of opportunity for growth here. So this is sort of one example of, of the type of activity we're working on. Um, so our next steps, um, as we as we close out, as I noted, um, we are we are in a, a, a growth and integration period, um, like so many of our other domains. As the two teams come together, so we're working to with the two teams finalize that domain charter and deliverables to strengthen our communication and infrastructure support of the two um, networks together. Um, we are actually finalizing a survey of our core domain site. Or, it, we're, we're finalizing the results. We've, we've done the survey, we've sent it out, we're getting our results back um, of our core domain site leads to learn a little bit more about um, the particular activities at their individual sites, what their goals are, specific goals are for the future and what particular um, work groups um, and domains they would like to engage with. We'll of course be continuing to support ongoing initiatives such as SciStart um, and the curriculum I mentioned um, and uh, really working to establish um, and build on this strong coordination and partnership with our PC MHA technical assistance teams. Um, so we're, we're incredibly excited about the work ahead um, uh, and look forward to our panel discussion in a little bit. So thank you all.